Hi and welcome to Crash Course Catholicism, a podcast about Catholic teaching and why it makes sense. I'm your host, Caitlin West. Hey friends, how you doing? Welcome to episode 72. Just had to double check that. 72. <laughs> um, this episode is on vocation, how vocation works. So, In today's episode, we're going to answer some questions like, what does it mean to have a vocation? Does everyone have a vocation or is it just some people? And how can I know what my vocation is? Now, this episode might be helpful for people who are considering the question of vocation for themselves, but it will also hopefully be helpful for people who know someone who is thinking about vocation or who comes into contact with people who are thinking about vocation or even for parents. Like if you're a parent who has kids who might be thinking about this topic at some point, then hopefully this will be a helpful episode for you too. So, The first question to begin with is, does everyone have a vocation? And the answer to that question is yes, absolutely everyone has a vocation. So at times that word vocation has been associated specifically with the call to celibacy. People have thought about it in the sense that, like, you have a vocation if you're called to the priesthood or to the religious life. But if not, then you don't have any particular vocation. But that's actually not what the church teaches. If we think about the word itself, the origin of the word vocation is the Latin word vocare, which means to call, right? To be called by God. Now, absolutely every person in the world is called by God to something. First and foremost, every single person shares a common vocation. We are all called to be with God forever in heaven. We're called to love God and to give ourselves completely to him. So we refer to this as a call to holiness or to sanctity. So this is from 1 Thessalonians 4.3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And that's God's will for everyone. As well as that, God has called all of us not just to get to heaven ourselves, but also to try to help others to get to heaven as well. So Mark 16, 15, our Lord tells his disciples, go out to all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. So we refer to this as a call to apostolate or evangelization. So this is the kind of twofold vocation of every single person. And we can summarize that vocation in one single word, which is love. We are called to love God and to love others. Now, within that vocation, each person will have their own specific path, a certain way in which God calls them to grow in holiness and to carry out apostolate in their life. So we might be called to give ourselves to God in one of four different ways, through the priesthood, if you're a man, through the religious life, so as a nun or a sister or a monk or a friar, through lay celibacy, so remaining celibate, but not in the context of the religious life, or through marriage. And we refer to those four paths as states of life. So everyone is called to love God and love others within a particular state of life. Each of these states is like a means by which we become a gift to God and to others. Now, as well as having a kind of overarching vocation to a certain state of life, God also calls every one of us every single day in little, unique, individual ways. In fact, God is constantly calling us to love him and to love others throughout the day. So that might be through the work that we do, through our relationships with the people around us, in our prayer, in all of those little sufferings of every day that we offer up. These are all ways that God calls us continually to draw closer to him. So if we think about this concept of vocation, we can think of it as like climbing a mountain. The pinnacle of the mountain is heaven, and we are all called to get there. We're all climbing that mountain, but everyone has their own path. And as we move along that path up the mountain, every single step that we take matters. Every step is either drawing us towards the peak or away from it. Okay, so those are the three senses in which every person has a vocation, a call to holiness, a particular state of life, And then in the kind of everyday ways in which we grow in holiness. Now, how do I know 
what my particular vocation is. And here I'm speaking specifically about that second way, like the state of life that I am called to. How do I know what God wants of me? Well, the first thing to remember is, as we've said, a vocation is a calling. It's a call from God. It's an invitation that we respond to. And what that means is that it's not my job to kind of initiate, to decide what I think my vocation is. My job is to listen to God's call. So Fulton Sheen puts it like this. He says, no true vocation starts with what I want or with a work that I would like to do. So discovering our vocation, it's not like picking out an ice cream flavor, right? Where we stand around and then we sort of taste five different flavors and we think, oh, well, which of these appeals to me the most? Instead, what we should be asking is, God, what do you want me to do? What are you asking of me? So it's a process of listening and being receptive to what God is asking of us. Pope Benedict XVI writes that, The Lord has his plan for each of us. He calls each one of us by name. And our task is to be listeners, capable of perceiving his call, to be courageous and faithful so that we may follow him. Now, when we say that no true vocation starts with what I want, that does not mean that you can't desire a certain vocation or that desiring a vocation is a bad thing, or that your desires are never going to line up with what God wants. Sometimes we can fall into this trap of thinking, oh, well, I really want to get married, or I really want to become a religious, therefore that can't be what God wants of me, or I should mistrust that desire because it's coming from me and not coming from God. Well, Father Gregory Pine talks about how God makes every single person in a certain way, like he shapes you for a particular calling. He's not going to shape you for something that you're not made for or not give you the capacity to do the thing that he's calling you to do. So it makes sense that very often there will be some kind of correlation between what you're drawn to and what God wants. The important point is to remember that your desires are not the foundation of a vocation. They don't constitute a calling. So we can't say, you know, I really want to do X, Y, and Z, therefore I have a vocation. The starting point, the root of our calling is God's call, what he wants. But what I want matters. It's kind of like, you know, if I'm trying to discern whether a guy that I'm dating is the guy that I should marry. Well, in that process of discernment, it really matters whether or not I'm attracted to him. You know, I should pay attention to how I feel about him. However, I can't go so far as to say, well, I'm attracted to him, therefore he's the one. Because there are other factors that we have to consider, not just whether or not I'm attracted to him. So Fulton Sheen, I mean, he's the one, right, who said no true vocation starts with what I want. In the book where he says that, which is his autobiography, he then immediately goes on to talk about how all his life he wanted to be a priest. He says, I can't remember a time when I didn't want to be a priest. Apparently, he used to pray the rosary as like a little boy and he would beg God for a vocation to the priesthood. It's so beautiful. And that's precisely the dynamic that we should be aiming for. So Fulton Sheen recognized a desire in his heart. He was like, okay, I want to be a priest. But he didn't end there. He then started praying to God. He turned to God and was like, okay, God, what do you want? Please let it be this. (laughs) This is what I want, but what do you want? So that's the starting point when we're discerning a vocation is prayer, spending time with God. And not just prayer where we're just incessantly asking, God, what do you want of me? What do you want of me? But also prayer where we just spend time with him, where we just get to know him and we learn how to recognize the sound of his voice. Because the more that we do that, the easier it will be to recognize when he's speaking to us and when something is coming from him. I remember reading a book once and I can never remember what this book was. I read it on a retreat and I've never been able to track it down, but I found this really helpful. It talks about how if you're, if you talk to someone on the phone every single day, you get to learn the sound of their voice and then you can recognize when it's them on the phone. Like if my sister calls me, if I, I mean, this is, we have caller ID now, so I always know who's calling, but if I don't look at my phone, I just pick up and she starts talking. I instantly know that it's her talking to me. I don't need to like figure it out, but 
okay, let's say that someone calls me and I haven't talked to them in like five years and they call me on a landline, if those still exist, (laughs) and I pick up the phone and they're like, hey, it's me. And I'm like, oh, who? (laughs) Because I haven't heard that person's voice in so long that I can't recognize it. Well, it's the same with our relationship with God. If we're not praying regularly, then we're not used to the sound of his voice. And so that's when we can get into that kind of that rut of thinking, oh, is this coming from me or is it coming from God? It can be really hard to discern. So that's step number one is prayer, getting to know God. And then in tandem with that, growing in virtue, saying yes to the little calls of every day. So if we go back to that image of climbing a mountain, if we're taking little steps in the right direction every single day, we're looking at our compass, we're reading the map, we're listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, we're eventually going to find that like we are actually on the path that God wants us to be on. And then thirdly, spiritual direction, talking to someone who can give us some insight and can help us to differentiate between, you know, my own desires or fears or anxieties and the voice of God. So one really good idea is to talk to a priest, especially to a priest that knows you and can help kind of give you some guidance. Another really important step in the process of discernment is actually taking a step. (laughs) Father Mike Schmitz talks about this. He talks about how taking action is actually part of the process of discernment. Discernment isn't just sitting around and thinking. It actually involves doing. So it's really easy to just stay in that space of just praying and asking God and wondering what he wants and never actually doing anything about it and sort of waiting until we're completely 100% sure before we take a step. So there's this great quote from Pope Francis. He says, The joy of the gospel will not fill our hearts if we keep standing by the window with the excuse of waiting for the right time without accepting this very day the risk of making a decision. Vocation is today. The Christian mission is now. It's like Captain Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean. If you were waiting for the opportune moment, that was it. (laughs) We can't sit around waiting for the opportune moment when all the stars align and everything is perfectly clear until we take a step. Sometimes we just need to act. And part of that is remembering that our vocation is a path to sanctity. It's not the end point. It's not like, you know, we embark on our vocation once we're already saints. We shouldn't wait around until we're perfect people before we take the next step. I mean, there are some things that we might need to deal with before we take the next step. Like, for instance, if you're struggling with like a pornography addiction, you shouldn't be dating. You need to deal with that first. Deal with that and then make the next decision. But... We also can't swing so far in the opposite direction that we become kind of immobilized by fear because we're not perfect yet. In fact, sometimes it's not just a good thing, but it's kind of a crucial thing that we take a step towards a vocation, even when we're not 100% sure that it's what God is calling us to. So let's say that you want to climb a mountain, but you don't know exactly where the path is or which path you should take. So you just stand there and refuse to move until you can see the path clearly. Well, maybe the path that you need to take is 400 meters away and behind a clump of trees. So you are literally never going to find it if you don't start taking steps. So taking a step in terms of vocation might mean, you know, going to the seminary or dating that person, even if you're not hundred percent sure that they're the one or talking to someone and saying, Hey, I think this might be what God is calling me to. What's the next step? And the really important thing about taking a step is that that's all you're doing. You are taking a step in a particular direction. You are not locking yourself in. So like you go from zero to a hundred. And if you take a step towards a vocation, you can never turn back or sort of reroute. And in fact, that's actually built into the discernment process of like any kind of vocation. It's pretty much impossible to be like, okay, I think that God might be calling me to this thing. And now I'm immediately locked in. That is not how it works. And it's actually 100% okay. If you take that first step or that second step or that third step, and then you realize, oh, okay, this is actually not the right thing for me. This isn't what God is calling me to. That's okay. That's not a failure. You have not failed. If you discern that God is not calling you to something, that's part of the process of discerning is taking steps steps that, okay, they might not lead you exactly where you thought they would lead you, but you're still kind of making progress up that mountain. 
It's also important that during that process of discernment, we don't sort of sit around and wait for some kind of earth shattering light bulb moment where God reveals our exact vocation to us. I mean, some people experience it like that. Like, so they have a kind of St. Paul style calling where God knocks you off your feet and reveals your vocation to you. But for most people, we figure out what God wants of us bit by bit, slowly over time through saying yes to the little calls from God each day. That's actually just the normal process of discernment. So we shouldn't be concerned if we haven't had some kind of crystal clear, you know, one fell swoop revelation from God. I think one of the reasons why God allows that, that sort of slow process of discernment is that that process itself is one of the ways through which God purifies us and makes us holy and even prepares us for the vocation that he has planned for us. The process of being unsure and maybe of suffering and trying different things or figuring out or feeling like I failed or like, no, that wasn't it. That whole process helps us to become more detached from our own will and more conformed to the will of God. It's actually a gift and we shouldn't try to avoid it by rushing to a kind of crystal clear answer of the question of what God wants of me. We should also try to avoid the trap of looking for an extraordinary calling or assuming that uh, our vocation is going to be something kind of really dramatic and sort of out of this world. Sometimes, you know, we can assume that vocation is really radical and that it's going to lift us out of our ordinary life and plonk us somewhere completely different. And of course, that does happen for some people. But very often, God will actually ask something much more straightforward of us. So we can think of our episode from like our last episode on St. Gianna, how at first she thought that God was calling her to go and be a missionary in Brazil. And then eventually she realized that God just wanted her to stay right where she was and become a saint. Then she did become a saint by being a really great mother and doctor We shouldn't be afraid of ordinary life or of a vocation that looks a little bit more prosaic and a little bit less flashy. We have to remember that God isn't necessarily calling us to do extraordinary things. He's calling us to be extraordinary people. And that is really what's at the heart of our vocation, not something that's really exciting and dramatic, although, of course, every vocation is exciting and in one sense dramatic. But the main thing is that it is our path to sanctity. That's what's going to make us a saint. A final point about discernment. God loves us and we can trust him and we can trust that he actually wants us to discover our vocation. He's not hiding it from us. Father Gregory Pine talks about this. He's like, look, God is even more in love with your vocation than you are. He's more invested in you discovering your call than you are. He's not like, you know, like the goblin king in Labyrinth. I don't know, have you ever seen Labyrinth? If you haven't, then what are you doing with your life? But basically, in the movie Labyrinth, there's this girl and her baby brother gets taken by the goblin king. And then the goblin king goes and hides at the center of a maze and then puts up all of these like roadblocks, you know, in throughout the maze and sets all of these puzzles and challenges. And the girl has to to try to get to the center of the maze by some time, it's like midnight or whatever. Otherwise, if she doesn't make it, then her baby brother will turn into a goblin. And the goblin king is doing everything that he can to try to like f- make sure that she doesn't get to the center. Okay, God is not like that. He's not at the center of a maze holding our vocation and being like, ha ha, good luck figuring it out. No, he's with us. He's guiding us. He's helping us. He wants us to find our path so we can trust him. Now, Let's go over a few reasons why we should not consider a particular vocation, whatever that vocation might be. What are some reasons why we should not pursue that vocation? Okay, we should not pursue a certain vocation if we're pursuing it because we're running away from something. When it comes to our vocation, we should always be running towards something and not running away. So if I find myself thinking, look, I don't think I'm ever going to find someone who loves me. So maybe I should be celibate or I'm really scared of being in a relationship or being vulnerable with someone else. Or, you know, my parents were divorced and I think that marriage is a sham. So I want to be celibate. Okay. Those are all terrible reasons to pursue the calling to celibacy. Okay. A vocation isn't a cave that we go and hide in or, you know, a comfortable place that we go to because it's easier than the thing that maybe God is calling us to. 
We should also avoid pursuing a vocation just because we think that it's objectively a better thing to do. So if I find myself thinking, well, celibacy is objectively a higher calling and I want to be the best person that I can be. I want to be a saint. Therefore, I should be celibate because that's the higher calling. Okay, wrong way to go about it. So by way of analogy, so I have a heart condition, right? It's a congenital defect that I've always had. And what that means is that there are certain forms of exercise that I should not do, even though objectively they are good things. So running, for instance, running is awesome. I have many people in my life who are runners and they are amazing at it and it makes them really fit and healthy and happy. And that's great. If I try to do running, then my face will go blue and I'll pass out. Okay, not a good thing, even though objectively running is awesome. And the same thing can happen with our spiritual life, right? There might be certain things that are objectively really good and even higher callings. We might look at other people and be like, well, that person's really holy and they're doing that thing. Therefore, I should do that thing. But we need to take into consideration the way that God has made us. There are certain things that he has made us for and certain things that he hasn't. And our, our sort of focus shouldn't be on what's objectively the best thing to do and I should do that. The focus should be on what does God specifically want of me? Okay, now question, what should you do, do you, <laughs> what should you do if you or someone you know is becoming like upset over the vocation question? Because this can happen, right? Where we are struggling to answer this question. What does God want of me? And we kind of get stuck in a rut and we can't get past it and we're obsessing over it. Okay, what should we do if we find ourselves in that place? Well, Father Mark Mary, he's a Franciscan fire of the renewal. He talks about how we are not meant to live in that space of like, what's my vocation? What is God calling me to? There is a point where constantly obsessing over the question can become unhealthy. So if we find ourselves in that space, there are a couple of things that we can do slash bear in mind. First of all, we have to remember that God brings peace. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no suffering while we're discerning our vocation or that it's not a difficult process, but there is a difference between suffering and losing our peace. If we notice that we're losing our peace over the question of vocation, then maybe that's a sign that we need to actually set that question aside for a little while and focus on our relationship with God. Return to that rootedness in him. Focus on growing in trust. Focus on prayer and the sacraments. In other words, return to those little yeses of every day rather than getting obsessed over the big question of, you know, what state of life we're called to. Secondly, we have to remember that whatever God is asking of us, he will always be with us and he will give us the grace to do that thing when and only when we need it. So Father Jacques Philippe talks about this. He talks about how God does not give us the grace to cope with things that aren't happening yet. He gives us the grace in the moment when we need it. So if we're praying about a particular vocation and we're thinking, I could just never do that. Like I could never be a parent or a spouse or a priest or a celibate person. We have to remember that, okay, maybe God hasn't given us those graces yet because we're not there yet. Our job right now isn't to kind of project ourselves into the future and sort of try to internally live out that vocation and see if whether or not we could do it. Our job right now is just to keep our eyes on God and take one step at a time and trust that he will give us what we need when we need it and not before. Thirdly, we have to remember that whatever path we choose to embark on, and it is a choice, right? We get a free choice. We'll talk about that more in a second. But whatever path we embark on, it's not going to be a linear, neat path in which everything is fine and everything is perfect. We will, in all likelihood, encounter crises along that path. We will experience suffering. We'll experience times of difficulty. We'll experience times where we feel like we're sliding backwards. And that's okay. That is part of the process. So again, let's return to that that image of climbing a mountain. When you are climbing a mountain, you're not always going in like a direct straight line from the bottom to the top. Sometimes in order to get to the peak, you kind of have to go sideways for a while, or maybe you go down for a bit and then you go back up again. That's actually a super normal part of climbing a mountain. So we shouldn't be held back by fear, by this 
idea of like, well, what happens if, you know, I have some sort of crisis or something goes wrong or, you know, it's like 10 years down the track and then I discover that I picked the wrong vocation. Everything goes really badly. Okay. Yes, we probably will experience suffering at points along the path and we will experience times when it's not perfect and we're not perfect and we fall. And, you know, there's actually a book by Father Thomas Keating called Crisis of Faith, Crisis of Love. And it's great. I really recommend reading it. It's all about how sometimes God allows us to go through periods of difficulty in order to draw us closer to him. Okay, and then a final question before we wrap up. What happens if I feel like God is asking something of me? And in fact, I'm pretty sure it's what he's asking, but I really don't want to give it. Let's say that I really feel called to a particular vocation, but I just really don't want to do it. <laughs> what happens then? Do I have to do it? Is it a sin if I say no to God? Okay, well, in answer to that question, I'm actually just going to read a quote from Pope Francis. He says, More than anyone else, Jesus respects our freedom. He does not impose, but proposes. Make room for him and you will find the way to happiness by following him. And should he ask it of you, by giving yourself completely to him. Now, I love this quote because in it, Pope Francis says two really important things. First of all, he reminds us that God wants us to use our freedom. God never coerces us. He never forces us. He shows us his plan and he invites us to follow it, but he never forces us to conform to his will. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the Holy Father reminds us that our greatest happiness lies in following our Lord. So this is kind of like a paradox, right? We're like, you're completely free, do whatever you want, but your greatest happiness lies in following God. And it can sound like we're saying, yeah, do whatever you want, but really do what God wants you to do. And this is really, this is the great mystery of freedom. God, he does leave us completely free. Like we are genuinely completely free. If God has called us to something, we can say no to that call and that is okay. Father Mike Schmitz talks about this when he describes his like vocation journey. He says that when he felt the call to the priesthood, he felt like our Lord was saying to him, look, this is what I want from you, but... Whatever you decide to do, I'll be here and I will love you no matter what. The same is true for us. Whatever we decide to do, God will love us. And it is so important that we make a choice from a place of genuine freedom, that we act freely and joyfully. At the same time, here's the paradox. At the same time, God is God. He is a father who loves us infinitely. He loves us more than we could ever love ourselves. He wants our good and our happiness more than we could ever want those things for ourselves. So we can actually trust that if he's calling us to something, he knows what he's doing. And this is the final thing to remember, that a vocation is a gift. It's not a burden. It's not something that God is kind of like forcing us to do. And we just have to deal with it, get through life with this vocation, you know, on our backs. A vocation is a gift and it is ultimately a path to true happiness. So I'm going to end with a final quote from Pope Francis. In this quote, he's talking about holiness, but I think we can replace the word holiness with vocation, returning to the idea that we started this episode with, right? That ultimately our vocation is to holiness. Okay. So Pope Francis says, do not be afraid of holiness. And we can replace that with, do not be afraid of your vocation. <laughs> It will take away none of your energy, vitality, or joy. On the contrary, you will become what the Father had in mind when he created you, and you will be faithful to your deepest self. I think that is such a beautiful quote. So, on the Sunday just past, so like yesterday, <laughs> we had the World Day of Prayer for Vocations. So, the de that day has obviously passed, but... We can always pray for vocations. Let's keep praying for anyone who is discerning their vocation. And let's pray for ourselves and for each other that we might live out the vocation that God has given us with joy and with freedom. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's it for today. Um, in our next episode, we're going to pick up where we're leaving off. So we're going to actually talk about freedom in our next episode. What does it mean to be free, to be truly free? And how do we balance freedom and obedience? Awesome. Okay. Can't wait. I will talk to you in a fortnight. Have a great one. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Hey friends. 
friends. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you are enjoying the podcast and you would like to see it continue and reach many more people, then I invite you to consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the show notes of this episode. There are many running costs associated with running a podcast and I rely 100% on the generosity of patrons. Thank you so much to those who already support the podcast. And most importantly, please continue to pray for me and for all of those who are listening.